Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining this um, e-seminar. This is organized by uh, the ERA, jointly with the Genes and Kidney Working Group. And representing the Genes and Kidney Working Group is myself, and then uh, two moderators, Jan Halbritter and Emily cornett -Legault. Um, And this seminar is also joint with the YMP, the, the Young Nephrologists Group, and Eric Ollinger, our guest speaker, is part of the YMP group. Uh, so we've got all boxes ticked and representatives from across um, the spectrum of nephrology here. So by participating live in this e-seminar, you'll earn one EU credit uh, for your medical education. And um, right at the end, there's a kind of feedback form that you have to fill in uh, to get your uh, CME credits. Um, so uh, that will be really useful for you to do. So um, I'll just introduce our, our faculty and our guest speakers now. So on the faculty here, we have uh, the pleasure of having Jan Halbritter from uh, Berlin in Germany, and also uh, Emily cornet de Gaulle from Brest in France. Um, I am John Sayer. I'm from Newcastle in the United Kingdom. And we're really honoured to have our guest speaker as the world expert, really, on uh, UMOD and ADTKD. This is Eric Ollinger, uh, who's recently relocated to Belgium, uh, having worked in various parts of Europe. Uh, and without further ado, I'll let Eric have the floor, and he's going to talk to us about understanding the pathogenesis of ADTKD. So thank you so much, Eric. Okay, thank you very much, John, for the introduction, and I hope you can see my screen. So I would like to thank the um, European Union Association and the Genes and Kidney Working Group for organizing this seminar and for inviting me to give this um, presentation on autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney diseases or ADTKD. So I have no conflict of interests, and I will, um, during this seminar, try to cover um, first the definition of this group of uh, ADTKD, also speak about the epidemiology and the prevalence of this um, disease among different groups of patients with kidney diseases. We will touch um, on the genetics and the clinical features of um, the different entities inside ADTKD. And we will, uh, at the end, speak about um, the diagnostics and the proposed algorithms of diagnosis and um, also the current and future therapeutic perspectives in ADTKD. So to start quite broadly, an important question for an nephrologist is of course, when to suspect a genetic kidney disease um, in general. And there have been uh, numerous studies that address these questions, often applying um, virtual panels or exomes yeah. in populations with various um, kidney diseases. And I show you here an example of um, a recent paper that um, performed an exome first strategy in adult patients with CKD, and he really delineated um, and confirmed some factors that were, were associated with an increased genetic yield in this population, which is not unsurprisingly a first degree history of kidney disease, an earlier onset um, of CKD, and different kidney um, diseases associated with a higher genetic yield, such as um, syndromic kidney diseases, but also the tubular interstitial diseases have rather a higher yield in terms of um, genetic diagnosis. And if you're interested by this, it will be out of the focus of this seminar, but there's a very nice recent review that looked into literature for different types of um, kidney diseases. What is the diagnostic yield in terms of genetic yield and what are the factors that influence them? Now, more specifically, so if you think that you are um, in front of a genetic kidney disease, when to think of ADTKD. And that's a little bit tricky because it's such an unspecific clinical presentation. So it's really more an exclusion diagnosis. So the, the first thing, of course, to exclude are um, environmental or exterior factors such as drugs that can give rise to a tubular interstitial nephritis. Um, it's also important to exclude that it's a primary glomerular disease because usually in ADTKD, we do not see a lot of rheumaturia or overproteinuria at the beginning of the disease. We also do not see usually very large or, or kidneys with a lot, a lot of cysts in ADTKD. 
and we usually um, have a positive family history, not always, but usually. And if we do not have a family history, and especially if the consanguineous family, maybe also think of recessive phenocopies, such as nephronophthysis. And if you are so in front of all these clinical criteria, um, then I refer you to, um, so you are in the suspicion of an ADTIC ID. I refer you to this 2015 um, clinical consensus report that really um, summarizes the, the basic clinical findings and histological findings in ADTIC ID. So which is the autosomal dominant inheritance, a progressive um, decline in um, kidney function, as mentioned, a bland urine sediment, and usually no proteinuria at the beginning. The kidneys are normal in size or small as the disease advances, and we might also find urinary concentrating defects, and for some etiologies, also extra renal features, as you will see. So the histology or the kidney biopsy is not mandatory to do the diagnosis, but if performed, it is rather unspecific, and we see interstitial fibrosis or tubal atrophy, really mimicking also what is seen in, in the recessive counterpart, which is nephronophthysis. And in this paper, also there are um, the clinical diagnostic criteria are outlined. Um, what is here important to mention is that you can have a strong suspicion that is based mostly on family history, but the only way to really um, get diagnosis is to, to get a mutation in, or to find a mutation in one of um, the genes associated with ADTKD, really highlighting the importance to seek a genetic diagnosis in this group of disorders. Now, what are the genes in ADTKD? So classically, there are five genes that have been associated with um, ADTKD, and by far the most common among them are, as you can see here, UMOD and Mark one so UMOD encoding for uromodulin and Mark one for mucin one um, REN and SAC61A1 are a really rare entities, and although HNF1 beta is a rather common genetic disease, its presentation as pure ADTKD is, is rare, as you will see. So if you have ADTKD, really the most common genes are UMOD and Mark one And you, the, the preferred terminology nowadays is ADTKD appended with the gene if you identify a gene. And if you have a clinical diagnosis of ADTKD, but no gene identified, then you can um, label the disease as ADTKD NOS for not otherwise specified. And you might know these um, disorders because they have been formally um, denominated as familial juvenic hyperacemic nephropathy or medullary cystic kidney disease type 2 for UMOD or medullary cystic kidney disease type 1 for mac one And these are misnomers, as you will see um, later on. Now, what is the prevalence of, of this group of, um, of diseases? So I present here a um, study from Ireland um, that looked into... Um, patients that had a KDGO uh, defined clinical diagnosis of IDTKD, and among them identified in the majority of them um, pathogenic variants in McQuan, UMOD, or HNF1 beta, and they extrapolated the number of end-stage kidney disease in this IDTKD cohort with the total number of end-stage in, in Ireland, and estimated that at least 0.5% of end-stage kidney disease cases are caused by IDTKD or um, 0 0.25 for UMOD and 0 0.25 for Mark one And these numbers are in very close agreement um, with the study of Group and the AL, the exome sequencing study, that investigated over 3,000 patients, um, mostly adult sporadic end-stage kidney disease cases, and identified in um, nine among them a um, pathogenic variant in UMOD. They did not look at Mark one but already like this, you can see that um, this entity was the third most common entity after ADPKD and Alport syndrome. And that's a recurrent feature. So it seems to be one of the three most common genetic entities. And also here they found that 0.3% of the patients with end-stage kidney disease had a pathogenic variant in, in UMOD. So really in close agreement with, with the Irish group. The next question we asked, and that's really collaboration with um, Anthony Blyer from the Wake Forest, so if you have, or if you fulfill the clinical criteria for ADTKD, as outlined in the KDGO consensus report, what is your diagnostic yield or how, how prevalent are these mutations? So we looked at 585 families that fulfilled the criteria for a suspicion of ADTKD and identified in 37% of them a pathogenic variant in UMOD 
and in 21% the pathogenic variant in MUC1, showing that if you select the patient according to this criteria, you have a genetic yield in over half of them. These criteria are not specific, and this is also highlighted by the fact that a, a large number of individuals do not have a genetic diagnosis. It might also indicate that the other genes that phenocopy um, ADTKD and that have not been looked into into this um, into this study. In terms of genetics, for UMOD, it's rather straightforward. So the very large majority of the variants are um, single nucleotide variants or missense variants. Um, there are a few small deletions or indels that have been described. And these variants cluster in the N-terminal part of the protein, so not in the zona pellucida domain. Um, the zona pellucida domain being closed and folded in the ER, in the endoplasmic reticulum, and probably more um, tolerant to missense changes. Over half of the variants identified affect a cysteine residue, and this is relevant because UMOD is rich in cysteines that form dissulfide bridges inside the, the protein structure, and that's probably important for the correct folding of uromodulin in the endoplasmic reticulum. And so the current pathophysiological um, understanding is that these variants confer, confer a gain of toxic function insofar that the mutant uromodulin accumulates and aggregates inside the endoplasmic reticulum and causes protostatic stress and by, by this disease. So it's really important also to mention that we do not expect a disease from predicted loss of function variants in UMOD. So you can have a deletion in UMOD, a large deletion or a stop variant. This is not causing or probably not causing any disease in, in humans. A few variants are um, more common than others. So usually there's a lot of different missenses as you have seen. There are families that have private variants and some variants are um, recurrent. And here's an example of a recurrent indel that is um, quite common in the UK. That's a probably a founder effect in the UK. And there are also other variants that are um, seen frequently in the United States, but that are not seen in, in Europe, are not commonly seen in Europe. So there are a little bit of variations um, according to geographical uh, location. Now for the genetics for MAC1 is much more complicated than for UMOD. So it's important to know that inside the inside the exon 2 of MAC1, there is a large variable number of tandem repeat, which basically is um, a repetition of um, repeats that have 60 nucleotides that you can see here. And these 60 nucleotides are repeated in e for each individual among 20 and 120 five times in a, in a row. And this number are variable in each allele and are, are variable between families and between individuals. And to add a further layer of complications, so each of these um, repeats is not completely similar. There are slight variations and there are 34 different repeats that have been identified. And so they are not all the same repeats. And this is really this genetic architecture of this VNTR that made the genetics so challenging. Um, mainly for three reasons. So firstly, these repeats are GC rich. So it's very difficult to amplify or to enrich them with PCR based approaches. Because you have this repetition of very similar sequences, it's also very diffi difficult to map short read sequencing data into this VNTR. And lastly, imagine that you have one variant in one of these repeats, you would have then 99 other repeats that do not have this variant. And you have a skewed ratio of the of the the mutant repeat versus a lot of copies of, um, of wild type repeats. And so it's very difficult to, um, to investigate this part um, genetically. And we will see at the end of the, in the diagnostic section of what are the tools that are available nowadays. Important here to say is that the large majority, over 90% of the cases described to date, are caused by a cytosine duplication after a stretch of um, seven uh, cytosines as seen here, and they are more rarely inside the VNTR, also other variants that have been described. And up to date, I think there are two case reports describing um, frame shifting variants that are before the VNTR. All of these variants, um, no matter if they are before the VNTR or inside the VNTR, lead to exactly the same frame shift of the, uh, of the protein sequence. And you, you have so a neoprotein that have different biochemical characteristics 
and you have at the end of the VNTR a premature stop codon. And this neoprotein with these different um, biochemical properties accumulates in the ER to Golgi compartment and also there causes proteostatic stress, similarly a little bit to the human concept, um, and this causes probably disease. But here, so very different and quite complex genetics for ADTKD Mark 1. Now, is it important to have a genetic diagnosis? Um, so we have seen in our cohort that patients that have a mutation, so ADTKD patients with a mutation in UMOD, compared to those that have no UMOD mutation, no Mark 1 mutation, have a slightly more severe um, kidney disease with earlier onset of end-stage kidney disease and also um, more earlier onset of gout. So it seems that having a mutation in this quite heterogeneous LTKD group is rather associated with a worse prognosis. And if we compare UMOD and MAC1, we also see that um, there's a slight differences. So from MUC1, the median age of end-stage kidney disease is roughly 10 years earlier than for ADTKD UMOD. So a little bit more severe, generally speaking, a little bit more severe progression of kidney disease in um, MAC1. Um, the situation is very striking for um, hyperacemia and gout, which is very prevalent and um, of, of early onset in um, ADTKD UMOD with a median age of first gout crisis at 30 years. And this is absolutely not the case for Mac one So this seems to be specific really for ADTKD UMOD. The, the mechanism of this hyperacemia and gout, so it's a renal or tubular hypoexcretion of uric acid, but it's not exactly understood up to date why um, this happens in ADTKD UMOD. So this remains quite mysterious for the moment. Some hypotheses say that it's secondary to dehydration, um, but it's likely that there's some other mechanism that's specific for humor that might be involved in this. Now to come back to the to the point that was mentioned in the beginning, um, kidney cysts, um, there have been several studies showing that um, renal cysts are not pathognomonic in these diseases. We see around 30% of individuals with human mutations that have renal cysts, they are never medullary, and around 50% of individuals with Mach 1 variants have renal cysts, and also here they are not medullary. So really to call this a medullary cystic kidney disease was quite a misnomer, and this should not be used anymore as, as, um, as this disease name. If you go back for to the clinical progression of the kidney disease, you can see for ADTKD Mach 1, that there's a large variability of uh, progression of kidney disease, both um, between families. So here you see individual families. This is the age of end stage kidney disease. So there's a difference between families, although they have all the same citizen duplication. But also inside the families, you see large variability in terms of um, progression and onset of end stage kidney disease. And that is really something that's not well understood for Mach 1 and starts to be a little bit better understood for UMOD, where the same phenomenon are seen. So you see here different families which have different mutations and inside the families, so you have um, um, different progression of kidney disease. So these are um, mutation independent factors that influence the progression because inside the same family, you have different um, ages of end stage kidney disease. And this could be, um, as you will see, gender could play a role as males are, uh, are more prone to early end-stage kidney disease, but also other genetic modifiers that are not shared um, by family members might play a role here. And what comes out more clearly now is that also the human mutation um, might change your risk of developing end-stage kidney disease. There are some mutations that are classically associated with earlier onset of end-stage kidney disease, and other mutations are considered as milder mutations. So that may also uh, play a role. So as mentioned before, um, if you're interested on the predictors in your patient of um, when your patient will develop end-stage kidney disease, that is something that has been looked at by the group of Anthony Blyer, and I show you here the, the paper. And so basically the finding is that there's a certain correlation between the severity of an human variant as it behaves in vitro, in cell systems, 
and the clinical behavior. So classically, those variants that have a more severe retention in cell systems have also, in, in general terms, an, an earlier onset of end-stage kidney disease, so what they call the in vitro score. And then it has been shown that um, male gender is associated with a worse prognosis, but that also there's an association with the parental age and especially the maternal age of end-stage kidney disease and the province age of end-stage kidney disease. And now I just show you this example here to highlight the spectrum of, of mutations that can be from fully penetrant and rather severe end-stage kidney disease to, to mild variants or even non-Mendelian variants. And I show you the example of um, this humor, the T62P variant um, that behaves in, an, in a non-Mendelian fashion. So that's a variant that is not so uncommon in individuals of European ancestry. One in 1,000 is a carrier. And what we could show is that carriers with this variant have an, a slightly different distribution of uromodulin on their kidney biopsy. It is a little bit more intracellular. They have a little bit of ER stress which is intermediate between a full mutation and an, a wild type biopsy. And some of these individuals, and we do not know why or who, but some of those individuals develop um, a kidney disease. And if they do so, it's a much milder disease than what is seen in the um, Mendelian, the typical ADTKG UMOT um, disease. And we estimated on population level that the risk for kidney failure is an alteration of a fall. But so the clinical significance of this is not yet determined. This needs replication, but it's just to highlight. So this spectrum of humor variants from fully penetrant, ultra rare, to um, non-Mendelian risk variants, and probably more hypomorphic variants will come up in the future. So just because this is quite common, I want to say a word about HNF1 beta. Um, usually, this is known to the nephrologist as renal cyst and diabetes syndrome. Um, or to the pediatric nephrologist also as the most common cause of um, prenatal hyperechogenic kidneys. Um, usually the syndromic presentation with a rather cacwood-like kidney disease with diabetes, um, genital tract malformations, there can be abnormalities of the pancreas and, and from the liver, um, but it's probably very rare that you will see two ADTKD HNF1 beta, which is an, a fibrotic disease uh, as seen for humor. And the term ADTKD HNF1 beta should only be used when it's really a fibrotic disease and not this syndromic context that you see for HNF1 beta usually. So roughly half of the cases are de novo. So here the family history can often be missing. And if you have um, neurological features in your patient, especially neuropsychiatric diseases, then you have also to think of um, this, this larger, megabase large um, recurrent 17Q12 microdeletion syndrome that um, includes HNF1 beta and requires specific um, genetic testing um, to, uh, to detect it. But just, just for HNF1 beta because it's quite common in, in nephrogenetics. So let's pass now to the diagnostics. Um, I show here a slide that becomes more and more obsolete as probably most of labs would go for an, an, a panel kind of testing or unbiased testing. But um, what we wanted to show here is that if for some reason or for limited resources, you have to target or to use a pragmatic approach by targeting one gene after the other. So there are the clinical features as outlined that can help to orient uh, a gene over another. So this is gout for UMOT, um, cysts for DNA GB11 or the extra renal manifestation for HNF1 beta. And there are also scores that have been established for determining the probability of HNF1 beta or UMOT, for instance. And again, very important to mention that the classic approaches by, by Sanger or be it by um, the classic um, exome that you might do um, is usually not detecting um, MUC1 variants in the VNTR. That's really important to again um, highlight here. So to speak more in detail about MUC1 and what is nowadays available, um, the, the clinically most often used test um, nowadays is what is called a snapshot mini sequencing for um, MAC1. And this relies really on the fact that um, the most common variant is a cytosine um, duplication. And if you have this cytosine duplication at that particular site, this confers to your repeat resistance to endonuclease treatment. And so this test relies on the fact that in the beginning, you treat your DNA 
with an endonuclease, which digests the wild type repeat, and you really enrich your potential mutant repeat if you have a mutation. Once you have this enrichment, then you uh, amplify um, the region of interest, and you use um, this this deoxy single base extension assay, which is this, this, this snapshot technology, where basically you add after the, the seven cytosines, you add an usually a, a, a fluorescently labeled nucleotide that in the wild type situation would be an, an adenine and in the mutant situation would be a cytosine. And then usually by electrophoresis, you would then be able to, to detect what is what has been added and make the diagnosis this way. It's important to mention. So this is quite a laborious approach that is not cannot be integrated into a sequencing pipeline. So it's a specific test that has to be done in part. Uh, part. And the, the classic snapshot that is established in most labs is usually only performed for this particular cytosine duplication. So it would meet any other variants inside the BNTR. And so for this reason, it's really exciting um, that that now um, at least two studies have come up. One very recently. Um, showing alternative approaches that can be plugged into a sequencing a, a sequencing uh, pipeline. So more or more precisely into a short read sequencing Illumina pipeline, for instance. And these bioinformatic tools um, basically make use of an alignment-free genotyping. So you don't need to map your reads to the VNTR and um, with, with chimer algorithms manage to haplotype and to um, to genotype your VNTR. And in this um, study that just came out in 2023, the authors were able to show that this method is very sensitive and is able to detect different types of, of variants inside the VNTR. But now more application studies need to come and to see if really um, how this tool can be implicated in uh, implemented in different labs. But it's really interesting because it would really make diagnostics more easy for um, LTKD. And so this being said, what would be a diagnostic approach? And I show you here an example or a suggestion um, that has been published by the lab of, uh, of Michael Wiesner, who really um, takes into account um, the advantages of different techniques um, in what they call a clinically enhanced exome. So they would perform an exome sequencing to have, um, to have coverage of all coding areas but then add a customized panel to enrich um, reads for difficult regions, such as for the Mark 1 region or for the, um, the PKD1 exons that are present in pseudo exons, but also you can enrich it in specific intronic regions if there are variants described, as has been done for um, Alport syndrome and Gittleman syndrome, and you can also enrich for mitochondrial DNA. And on this raw data, and this short read sequencing data, you can apply these novel um, bioinformatic tools, such as the VN typer that I showed you before. And what these authors also suggest is that, is that it's still important to select the cohort in which you would apply this um, clinically enhanced exome. And what they suggest is to uh, privilege familial cases, syndromic cases, or simplex cases, but when the kidney disease is um, rather early onset, so before 50 years, and um, when secondary causes have been reasonably excluded. And in all cases, they also ex these authors also suggest to include the, um, the Alport genes because they can really phenocopy a lot of, um, of entities. And so applying then on this, on this data here, a virtual panel um, di dictated by your clinics, you can have a renome, so all the kidney genes or more specifically an ADTKD panel, um, and if it's negative, you could really open them to the exome in a kind of research setting or uh, reintegrate or reinvestigate your data if new genes uh, are coming out. So this would be one suggestion that have been put forward um, in literature and that really makes much more sense now that you have these tools that allow on sequencing data to investigate Mark 1 uh, on the same moment. And this tool would also cover most of the differential diagnosis for ADTKD, which are, um, as you have mentioned, um, autosomal recessive nephronophthysis, especially as we know that um, NPHP1 homozygous deletion can present in, as adult onset and stage kidney disease. There are atypical forms between ADPKD and ADTKD, such as DNHB11 and ALG5, where the cysts can be rather small cysts, rather small kidneys, and also fibrotic component. 
um, the call for genes, the mitochondrial variants, particularly these two variants that can present as isolated kidney disease, uh, interstitial kidney disease. And this you would also enrich then in your custom panel. And these genes have also been described in patients that present with an ADTKD-like um, disease. So this is the renal coloboma syndrome, Towns Brook syndrome, or some glomerular diseases as well, and extremely rare cases of um, of allelic mutations in REN can present as what, what has been labeled as autosomal recessive tubular interstitial kidney disease, but that's extremely rare as an entity. Now to finish, so um, for the treatment, up to date, so there's no specific treatment that addresses the underlying um, pathogenic problem in ADTKD. So we know that it's a progressive disease, and as the disease progresses, um, the treatment of choice is kidney transplantation. And we know that there's no, as expect, expected, there's no recurrence of the disease on the graft, and there's also no difference in terms of survival after kidney transplantation compared to other etiologies. Um, so we, there are a few particularities, I think, for the nephrologist following these patients, it's important to be careful with um, salt or water restriction and diuretics, because especially with REN and UMOT, have been reports that this patient can dehydrate quite quickly. And there have also been case reports showing the benefit or the safety and maybe benefit in very small reports um, that fluidocortisone might be used in ATKD REN patients. But no specific therapy to date. And this might change in the future because I show you here a um, publication from the Broad Institute from 2019 where the investigators identified a small molecule that was able to clear specifically the mutant MAC1 in uh, mouse models and in human organ reads. And um, clinical trials might in the future be available for this um, compound as it is a bio-oral available compound that, um, that seems to have drug-like properties. So that's really exciting um, for the future. And just to, to close a few more, um, two more example of recent basic science that could have implication for the treatment in the future. So this is a recent um, publication where we used um, two UMOT variants that in humans had very different clinical severities. So one very mild variant and one very severe variant. So in, in red, the severe variant, in blue, the mild variant. Um, it generated mouse models based on these two variants. These mouse models recapitulated the severity with one mild, one severe mouse model. And what was interesting is to see that the aggregates in the ER were different in these two conditions. So in the mild, we saw a uromodulin that was able to exit the ER. It was in a soluble form, while in the severe, it was really dense aggregates that were unable to exit the ER. And when we investigated then the mechanism that would allow these pathogenic aggregates to be degraded, um, we saw that um, the degradation was via autophagy and that by boosting autophagy you we were able to clear um uh to, to clear these aggregates out of um uh the the, the, the the transfected cells at this stage but this might show that in the future um autophagy inducing therapies could be used in in these disorders and this is a concept that has also been brought forward by this publication here that is also very recent in in which the authors um identified an endoplasmic reticulum resident um, uh, protein, this is called a MANF, for mesencephalic astrocyte-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which is usually secreted by the ER in cases of ES stress. And what it could show is that by overexpressing in mouse models this um, protein, they had really a very good result by reducing mutant human accumulation by, and this after disease onset. So they could really rescue um, mutant accumulation rescue kidney function, ES stress, increase autophagic activity, and reduce also fibrosis. And all this by um, balancing the uh, mitochondrial homostasis that seems to be important in the pathogenesis of, of UMOD. So another interesting um, therapeutic approach, and this, um, this, this protein has been patented also by this group, so showing the interest of in the future to develop these more targeted approaches in, in these diseases. So with this, I would like to close and to to sum up some take-home messages. So ADTKD, as we have seen in the beginning, very unspecific presentation, really an exclusion of other things, and but no really pathognomonic features. 
meaning that it's probably underdiagnosed, and you should test and try to seek a genetic diagnosis in these patients. Most common forms are human at Mark 1, which contribute at least to one in 200 patients with end stage kidney disease, probably more. Um, there are subtle differences between the, the two, but I think the most important is that gout really should point towards um, human mutation. Disease progression is very variable. We start only to understand what could be the, the effects of the human variants underlying it with this kind of aggregates that are in the more severe disease and so on, but this is really something that starts to emerge now. Um, for the genetics, so in humod missense variants or indels, no loss of function variants. And for Mark 1, of complicated genetics with um, new possibilities for testing that, that now the labs should in the future integrate into their um, sequencing pipelines. And also up to now, so no specific therapies available, um, no randomized clinical trials specifically for you, for NTKD for the moment. So really, the way to follow these patients is based on general CKD guidelines with a few uh, attentions to a few details, such as this uh, risk of dehydration. But in the future, a lot of promises for small molecules or better therapeutic proteins or um, use autophagy modulation in the future to treat um, these patients. So with this, I would like to thank um, very much the labs where I have the opportunities to work. This is the lab in, in Zurich of Olivier de Voigt, also um, the lab of John Sire in, in Newcastle. I would like to thank all the clinical um, and, and scientific collaborators, the funding bodies and um, the patients that contributed to this research, of course, and you for your attention. And I'm happy to, together with the panel, to answer your questions. Thank you very much. That's great, Eric. Thank you for that exceptional uh, overview of ADTKD. So um, the next part is going to be led by um, Emily and, and Jan. So every, over to you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you, John. So thank you very much, Eric, for uh, a fantastic talk, um, as uh, always. Um, and uh, I had uh, three questions. The, the first is uh, about... Um, um, so the diagnosis exclusion, you mentioned uh, that it's important to exclude um, other histories of drugs and so on. Um, and when you make the diagnosis of ADTKD in a patient and you draw the pedigree, uh, you usually identify several cases or sometimes identify several cases with uh, kidney disease related to a lot of well, other diagnoses, and some some of these are um, are, uh, for example, drug exposure that are sometimes uh, considered as being uh, causal for the uh, nephropathy uh, rather than. Uh, so I was wondering if in the cohort you reported you had uh, uh, data on the primary diagnosis before uh, the genetic diagnosis. Um, and if some of these patients were labeled with other uh, common differentials, how to spot ADTKD patients amongst uh, other causes? Yeah, I, I think it's really, um, so I, I don't have in, in our cohorts, we don't have this, um, this detail because we had a lot of collaborator data that just sent samples. I know, so from the, from the work of, uh, of the group of Michael Wiesner that looked in the German CKD cohort, um, that they selected so on, on, on phenotypic data and they included analgesic nephropathy or um, or drug induced um, interstitial nephritis as one of their um, clinical terminology and among these patients so they identified um, variants in um, in human age nephron beta and also in, in, the, in the cold four genes so showing that this is often a, a mislabel often also IgA nephropathy has been shown to be really a mislabel that then in the end can give rise to this ADTKD phenotype. But I think it's really, if you have a familiar cluster and it's not really clear what is the, it has been su suggested to be drug induced or, or hypertensive and so on, I think it's worth to, to take one case of the family and, and to test him. And probably even if one is negative, it could also be a phenocopy and you could, there are no guidelines for this, but you could also test the second one if, if it's really strong suspicion in the family and there's a strong family history. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. My, my second question was about uh, the UMOD uh, intermediate um, variants, the T62P. Or, and um, so um, the median age at ESKD was uh, 74 years, which is later than UMOD, but which is not that late. It means that 50% of the individuals you identified carrying this variant reached end stage before 64. So uh, my understanding is that you would not speak uh, in an individual of ADTKD U mode when identifying this variant, but it's not, um, what is your position on this? Because it's not so yeah. mild at the end. Yeah, so um, we, we, we really do not know why um, a minority really among those carriers um, show development of kidney disease. We know that C62P has a biological effect in um, all of them because we were measuring the, the urine levels of, of UMOD in those that had kidney disease or those that had no kidney disease. And in all of them, there was an intermediate reduction. And also in all the biopsies we looked at, we saw that the UMOD was in the ER and there was this bit of ER stress. But but it's likely that there are secondary hits, other factors that, that contribute then to disease. And um, I think at this point, probably it's, it's not, I, I don't know, I, should, I don't think that um, diagnostic labs should report it as a diagnostic finding at that time, in, at that um, point in time, because the information is really not valid in, in terms of giving predictive testing to other family members or to, to predict really what is the, the output. So I think really larger cohorts are needed and a better understanding of the intricate factors that, that then might help to predict who is progressing is, um, is needed. And along these lines, so um, there are other variants that, that very much behave like T62P and that we are investigating at the moment to try to better understand if there are common um, factors between them, be it at the, the mutation level in, in UMOD or be it that on, on, on other um, secondary hits in UMOD. But for the moment, we don't have the answer for that. So it's really more an, really an, an, a, a risk factor that needs replication in other cohorts for the moment. Thank you very much. I will leave the microphone to Jan uh, because of the time. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Emily. I, I just uh, to um, I have a, a question regarding this point too, because in this um, in this intermediate variant, um, uh, I'm aware of one or two pedigrees where really this variant is um, acting like a Mendelian. So you have several generations all carrying this variant and having ESKD. So I was I was going to ask you whether do you know these pedigrees where no one is affected? Um, so carriers are really healthy until 70, 75 years of age. Because, um, you know, in Nomad, for instance, there could be a lot of mild ADTKD cases, part of, uh, part of, part of the spectrum. Mm. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. There's an obvious bias there because the negative cases that we that we identified whereby um, by looking into data of the 1,000 genomes, for instance, and um, all the cases that 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 we have investigated in really in detail were because they had kidney disease and were referred to for having the T62P variant. So um, the only thing I think to answer this question is that, as far as I'm aware, so there are cases where the parents carry the variant, and at least at the the the, lat, the latest follow up do not have um, a CKD, um, but it's not excluded that all that all carriers, if living long enough, will at some point have an a decrease in GFR that is that is more large than you would expect in the general population. But it's a really good question. There's no obvious bias there. Yeah. Mm. And I think in these in this intermediate case intermediate variant cases, there can also be uh, two diagnoses, right? I mean, there can be IgA oh. and a humor risk variant, or you can have another... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah the family of Tony Blyer with MAC1 and T62P. And yeah. 
although it's difficult on a very small pedigree, but it looked like if you have the two, it seems a little yeah. more severe, but this is, of course, wishful thinking also, but it looks like on the few individuals you had, it, it was behaving like that. And just to make it more complex, I didn't go into this kind of details, but we know that there are these promoter variants in humans that increase or decrease the expression. And we know that the T62P, strangely enough, is always associated with, um, with the same promoter variant. So it looks like you have a, a, a backbone of a higher production of humor, and on top of this, you have uh, the, 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 this variation. And maybe it's really the interplay of, this, of these factors that, that make that uh, the risk is increased. Yeah. That's interesting. I was going to ask you, what about urinary humor levels? Um, so you published on that extensively, that it's part of the um, clinical characterization. Um, will that help here? And is it is there any, so for people, is it commercially available in a way? Or is it just done in your lab? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, so there are commercial ELISAs to measure it. The really difficult thing is that you need to have, um, so it's dependent on the GFR and um, and you need to have large references of different GFR um, bins to be able to compare it to. So I think in the, so in one of the publications, we, we also showed what would be the references in, with our test, but of course this has to be standardized for for other ELISAs. So that's really the difficulty to do it on an um, to do it in an, on, on a private basis. Um, I think so. If you go for an, a panel analysis and you check humor, I think it, it's really more scientific curiosity than than really important for the for the for the typical case of humor. It could be interesting if you have a variant um, of unknown significance to clarify um, its potential effect on humor. It could be interesting to characterize this this kind of intermediate things. And it could also be interesting to more on the pathophysiological um, understanding of, of related diseases if they affect human trafficking and so on. So that's really more a research question. Um, so in the in the real clinical care, the only thing I could see is if you do not have biopsy, then to see if you can have like a functional test and see if you have really a strong reduction in in, in, the, in the case. And that would be an argument then for the pathogenicity of the of, of the variant. And yeah. also we see that in, for instance, in Mac one there's absolutely no reduction in, in urinary levels of new mods. So it is really, it could also help if you do not have access to snapshot or to yeah. uh, this kind of tests, it could really tell you this is likely a new mod case and you can really focus on, on this diagnosis then. Okay. So in, 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 in uncertainty on the genetic level, you could use that as a, for diagnostic certainty. Yeah. yeah. So what people are interested in, I think, and I also see that in the Q&A, um, can you say a word on SGLT2 inhibitors and RAS um, blockade? Um, so what, what's, what's the role there? Yeah, so there, is no, um, there are no randomized trials, as far as I know, for, to address this question. Um, there has been a, a a very small trial done in by Anthony Blyer in the Wake Forest Institute, 12 patients, I think, with ADTKD um, um, that, that, that were given SGLT2 inhibitors. And the follow-up was only four months. And what basically they show is that the GFR was behaving as you would expect. So you had an, uh, a small decline in, in, in EGFR, um, which, which would be the mechanism by preserving the, the, the function. But they had a um, paradoxical effect of increased um, kidney injury molecule one in the urine and didn't really know how to interpret this because normally it should reduce and but there has been no follow-up uh, as to now of this of this small study which is really a, a very small uncontrolled study so there's really no data out there um, of the benefits or risks of giving SGLT2 inhibitors in this kind of uh, this population of patients and so for, for us blockade um, I think there's also here there's no no, no trials, but it is not, as far as I know, not contraindicated in Newmont and Mac one I think for um, in, in the group of the of RAN diseases, you have to be a little bit more careful because you have already um, uh, a state of mineral corticoid deficiency, and you and and there um, people are more careful in general. But um, but also here, no clinical trials are done. 
okay, hypertension so doesn't seem to be an early symptom, which so that is different to, for instance, ADP KD. The people are usually not hypertensive at uh, at first diagnosis, right? Yeah, yeah. No, people are not um, tend to, to to not be hi hypertensive in ADP KD. Either the contrary, so for REN, rather hypotensive. Thanks, Jan. So what I'd like to do, Eric, is kind of give you some more rapid fire type questions where you have to answer quite succinctly. Um, we're all, I think the audience is mainly nephrologists, people looking after families with um, inherited kidney diseases. And we see families with multi-generational disease, so grandparents and then parents and then children affected. So what all these patients ask us in clinic is, you know, when is there going to be a clinical trial that I can join uh, for this treatment? There's great excitement with these mouse models, but um, when can we sign up to a clinical trial, you know, for our children, for our patients' children, et cetera, with this disease? Yeah, so for the moment, as far as I know, it has no open clinical trial recruiting for the moment. Um, but there's really the, the, the promise for this broad compound because of its uh, chemical properties. And what I would advise is probably to get in contact with the national patient organization, which are very, very well informed. And so to be ready to um, when, when there's a clinical trial available. And also important to get um, a genetic diagnosis in each of the individuals, because probably that would be a prerequisite to enter the trial that you have an, an, an one diagnosis in, in each of the family members that want to take part of the trial. But for the moment, it's not yet available, but I think it's not an exaggeration to say in the next one or two years, probably if everything goes well, there would be trials that start. Okay, good. Um, you can say a br very brief answer to this question. Is ADTKD, I like this question, is ADTKD a ciliopathy? Like nephronectiasis, is it or is it totally different? And does the cyst distribution help you diagnose nephronectiasis versus ADTKD? Okay, so I think on the on the histological level, you can really not do the distinction between both, with the exception that, um, and we have been looking into this, that in ADTKD, um, so if human is not expressed at the primary cilium level and we know that if you have an if you have an impaired proteostasis and autophagy defects this can secondarily affect the primary cilium composition so it's not excluded that you will have morphological also functional changes in the primary cilium um, but i wouldn't really call it an, a primary ciliopathy by the simple fact that it's not that human is not expressed this has been shown several times not to express in the primary cilium level um, and i don't think that uh, based on histology or on the morphology of the cyst that you can distinguish um, between nephronostasis or IDTKD. So I, I don't think that that's possible. But I'm not sure if any other, if any one of the panelists has any other idea, but I don't think that you can really do this. Okay. You didn't mention this, but um, on on GWASs, UMOD often pops up in, you know, as a risk factor for chronic kidney disease. Can you explain why that is? Because I think the mechanism is different there. Yeah. So that's, um, here we are not speaking of, of rare genetic variants, but we are speaking of common polymorphisms. And this has been um, exceptionally well characterized for UMOT because there is an, um, there is an, uh, so an, a, a block of, of, of polymorphisms at the promoter level um, that functionally has been shown to drive the expression of UMOT. And so those individuals that, and, and roughly 20% of the population carry variants that, that reduce the expression and 80% carry variants that increase the, this allele frequency of these variants, of this, of this haplotype. And what has been shown basically in, in animal models and um, also by Mendelian randomization in humans is that if you have the variants that increase human expression, um, that you have an increased risk um, with an odds ratio around two, I think, there's an increased risk of CKD at population level. And if you have the, the variants that decrease UMOT levels, this is rather protective. And, um, but that's not an, a Mendelian penetrant disease, but here we are speaking on population level. And so the mechanism that has been put forward, but is not really proven until now is that 
the constant overproduction of a complex protein like humod um, would would lead to a stress of the ER that would susceptibilize the kidney to secondary hits and but that's something that is not not really um, very well understood at that at that uh, at that moment and just to follow up if I have just one minute so Anthony Bly asked the question whether these variants in the promoter might explain the viability in any TKD progression for human mutations because you have always the mutation with a promoter variant and this has not been proven um, um, however it seems that those patients that are clinically come to attention, there's an underrepresentation of the promoter variants that drive higher humor expression. So it's not excluded that if you have the variant that produces humor, you might have a more indolent disease that would then make that you don't come to clinical attention. So the, the question is not yet um, definitely asked whether these variants influence also ADTKG as a disease. Good. There's a question in the chat about gene therapy. So say the, these mutations are gain of function, why can't we just switch off the gene and then rescue the phenotype with a gene therapy approach? Yeah, these trials are um, underway in animal models. There has been a poster at the ASN this year, and um, I know that several groups are working on um, antisense oligonucleotides or interfering RNA therapies to just exactly do this. And also because we know that in a mouse KO does not have an, a very strong phenotype. So we know that probably it's safe, or relatively safe to reduce the levels of humor in, in humans. Okay. Um, I'll come back to Jan and Emily because I've been uh, taking the limelight here uh, for a final comment from both of you before I wrap up. Oh, uh, uh, final question, okay? Yeah, just a quick one, yeah. Percent. 45% of uh, ADTKD are resolved. Do we expect further further gene uh, heterogeneity or uh, do you know of any candidate genes um, in ADTKD or do you think it's only differentials? I think there's a lot of phenocopy inside and probably there are, um, there are genes that, that could mimic it at least that will be discovered in the future, but I think there's not a single genetic etiology that would explain the remaining cases. That's probably rather unlikely. Yeah. And for you, Jan, any final comment? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight the importance of uh, including Macron sequencing in our standard diagnostics. So either by long range um, methodology that's going to come up or by uh, the approach you presented, Eric, with customized uh, clinical exome short read uh, based. So that's going to be exciting and to see how frequent Mac 1 ADTKD really is. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and just if I can give to make really the um, the, uh, the parallelism to Numa that Mac 1, because also in Mac 1, there has been a very interesting paper um, showing that the length of the VNTR also influences the risk of, uh, of, of CKD. And so it could also be here that um, we would then understand in the future whether the variability of disease could be linked to the length of the VNTR. And that's really the long read sequence that will tell us this. And so really, Mark 1 is a very exciting field for the future and for the genetics to come up. Okay, so we're out of time. Um, that leads me to thank Jan and Emily, but most of all, Eric, um, for speaking today. Thank you for the ERA for hosting the session and organizing it, particularly uh, Frederica. And thank you to all the participants that have sent in questions, interacted with the Q&A. So uh, over to you, Frederica, for the um, assessment. So stay connected and give your feedback and we'll be you'll get your CME credits. So uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Think about AD, TKD when you next see your patient and uh, have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, Eric.